thank you all for coming to today's book panel discussion, uh, which is Lizzie's book's new book, Innovations in Refugee Protection, uh, a compendium of UNHCR's 60 years, including case studies on IT communities, Vietnamese boat people, Chilean exiles, and Nambian repatriation. So we are very delighted to have it, and I'd also um, like to thank the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs and the Institute for Global Law and Policy for co-sponsoring today's event. Um, so Louise Druk, our author, is a fellow at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative and a visiting scholar at Harvard Law School. She also serves as co-chair for UN Studies at Suffolk University and is a part-time lecturer at Leibniz University. And our panelists today, starting over here with Liz Maroney. Liz is the HLS Case Studies Editorial Assistant. And we are also delighted to have Heidi Matthews, an uh, SJD candidate here at the Harvard Law School, and also the IGLP Writing Workshop docent. And then we are delighted to also have Christian Lemke, the Max Weber Chair for German and European Politics with us, and also Palmer Lawrence, uh, Harvard Immigration and Refugee Clinical Program Research and Advocacy Fellow. So thank you all panelists. And um, I'd also just like to quickly mention that today's event is being videotaped. Uh, so if you ask questions at the end, which I hope you all will, uh, they will be part of the audio file for today. And then Louise, I will hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Suzanne, Executive Director of the Library. And I would also like to thank you very much, uh, Dean Martha Mino, to give us the honor in fact, giving refugees the honor to be here and for the many years of collaboration, of your personal collaboration with UNHCR, with the High Commissioner Sagata Ogata, and uh, the books which you then produce out of those very fruitful collaborations. We are very moved to have you here with us and that you would say a few words in the end uh, of our session. And we wanted to also pay tribute to the Harvard Law School students who have put on a very nice photo exhibition to honor the uh, Harvard Law School faculty uh, members, uh, female faculty members, especially also Dean Martha Mino. And this exhibition and reception is happening right this minute as we speak. And I want to pay tribute so that we are joining hands and that we are supporting each other in our uh, respective causes. Today is uh, an opportunity of um, thinking about those who are in less fortunate situations. And I have a few slides which uh, are aiming to help us to situate the book. And I'm very happy that we have wonderful colleagues at this side of the table joining me to say a few words from their respective perspectives. And if you don't mind, I would just go through my little PowerPoint very quickly and wonder whether you can read it. Perhaps the small prints are not uh, readable from where you are. But the first is a commendation by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees Assistant uh, High Commissioner for Protection, Erica Feller, who says, and I want to share that with you uh, because it is an endorsement um, by UNHCR. This book draws on an impressive array of significant first-hand sources and original materials to bring out the challenges of protecting refugees in ever-shifting political landscapes. Understanding the past is fundamental to dealing with the present and planning for the future. Drucker's careful scholarship draws on connections here in ways which will be of great value to students and practitioners alike. I want you to realize that this is not uh, a teaching book by an academic only, but by a practitioner who has been with the boots on the grounds only for two years at headquarters and all the other since 79 I have been a uh, representative of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees in four continents for UNHCR. So that is the perspective this book is taking. 
So as I just said, we are honoring International Women's Day, uh, and I'd like to again thank uh, Dean Martha Mino for supporting this series of book talks. I'm very grateful uh, for uh, Suzanne Vons, the Executive uh, Director of the Library, for supporting us and being us with us personally, and uh, for inspiring a wonderful team. I'm very grateful to Professor David Kennedy, Director of the Institute for Global Law and Policy, where this book is housed, and for his support. In fact, he was my second supervisor for my doctoral work in the 80s, and our collaboration goes back for quite a few years. I'm very grateful for the uh, co-sponsorship by the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs, especially Stephen Bloomfield and uh, Beth Simmons, and for the program on negotiation, and there with Susan Hackley and colleagues of the program, and there again, the collaboration goes a long way because uh, the High Commissioner Ogata received an award a few years ago as the best negotiator of the year from the program on negotiation. And when one of the students asked the High Commissioner, High Commissioner, how does one become the best negotiator of the year? She said, study history. <laughs> so that's why this book looks back and we do that together, but also to look ahead together. I don't want to uh, go on without saying really a very big thank you to all colleagues of the Harvard Law Library. And their amazing research advice by especially Ashleen Bulut, who is with us here in the room, who spent time with me on international refugee law search uh, appointments, and Lisa Brem, who is with us, who has uh, more on a personal basis said, this is uh, useful material, but it would be even more useful if it was case studies. And so I spent another year rewriting the material into case studies, and that's what it is now, and I'm grateful to both of you, but also to all the colleagues in the library. So the book is talking about 60 years of innovations by UNHCR. The case studies look at early warning, early alerts, and then coming over the last 30 years to cooperation with information technical communities in humanitarian work. It looks at the Vietnamese uh, boat people situation, and it looks uh, at the situation of Chileans who were in forced exile and where I, as a representative, worked uh, with uh, partners concerned to help bring this to an end. And I'm very pleased that we have Chris from Chile in the room, uh, because we have had long conversations. Uh, Chris is a student at the law school. Thank you for coming, Chris, and for all your colleagues who have been great human rights defenders. And it looks also at the integrated missions, uh, the first UN integrated mission, in fact, uh, to bring Namibians home from many parts of the country, uh, the world, from Cuba, Soviet Union, Norway countries, through Angola, to bring them all at the same time to Namibia for the elections. And the teaching note is providing some <coughs> hints and material for uh, facilitating teaching and learning these materials. Just a word, why did I get into humanitarian work? Many people ask, perhaps. As a German, I felt this very heavy uh, responsibility of what Nazi Germany has done to millions of people. And uh, the awareness that it doesn't take much to rewrite laws and burn synagogues and persecute enemies and burn human bodies. My mother used to be a president of the local Red Cross in Germany, and so the humanitarian blood was sort of injected into my veins. And after my time uh, studying at the Sorbonne in, Ch uh, in Paris, I went to Chile in 73 in summer uh, and uh, met Allende, spent a couple of months, and then uh, wrote articles about my coming back when then I got a phone call from the administration in Hanover, my city, that the first 50 Chileans are arriving out of the West German embassy in my city. I must be speaking Spanish, and we need help and volunteers to, to help and find housing and work and 
kids, schooling, etc. So that's my beginning from December 73 in refugee work. Now let's look at the refugee. The basic, and this book is really only since 60 years before and humankind has seen refugees the whole world uh, through for thousands of years, but this book is concentrating on the 60 years since this new refugee regime is in power. And it uh, is based on the statute, which is a General Assembly Resolution 428, which spells out the functions of UNHCR to promote accession to instruments and to uh, give guidance for the functioning of UNHCR to protect refugees and find solutions to their problem. That is the mandate. The convention, which was adopted 51, as one of the paragraphs of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights of 48, which says every person has the right to seek and to enjoy asylum in another country. This uh, 51 Refugee Convention gives the definition of a person refugee is a person owing to well-founded fear of persecution for reasons of race, religion, nationality, social group or uh, political opinion outside of the country of nationality or residence. The spots which you see in red are those one third of the community who have not yet ratified the Geneva Convention. And my case studies contrast, in fact, the case between Chile and Singapore. Chile had ratified in 1972 the Geneva Convention, which allowed and, and enabled the Office of the High Commissioner for Refugees in 73 after the coup d'etat to make contact and to say we are concerned about the 5,000 refugees in the country. We had a legal standing connection with the state of Chile. The UN works with the states and through governments, of course. But uh, Singapore, where I then was working for three years, is, was not and is still not a member of the convention. And so you have to weigh your, work your way through in finding solutions for protecting refugees. And my mission to you is whenever you get a chance to convince states or non-governmental organizations to lobby for the ratification of the convention by those states which have not yet ratified, that is, by, for example, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Libya, Syria. It happens to be those states where there are quite a bit of the majority of refugees nowadays. Why? Because if you if you ratify a convention, you assume international refugee protection obligations. Just as food of salt. What are the trends? If you just look from 1960, when we had the time before the decolonization and independence of African countries, but then little by little, as borders were drawn up and the same ethnicities were cross borders in different countries and wars and independence wars. You had an increase which culminated really with the Yugoslav war when uh, in around 90 to 95 we saw the top of the production of refugees in the conventional sense of the term which now has gone down uh, but not without reason because what we see due to internal wars and in production of people fleeing many times for the same reasons as uh, refugees, that is they stay within their own countries. And here we are getting in very deep waters in terms of sovereignty, in terms of their nationals in their own countries. And the UN High Commissioner for Refugees does not have a mandate uh, a priori for this category of persons because they're nationals in their countries only if the Secretary General, the General Assembly or Executive Committee or group of states ask the UN High Commissioner for Refugees to come in such as in the Bosnia War, UNHCR was declared lead agency 
for assisting the internally displaced uh, people needing protection. So where are we today? We are at total 11 million refugees in the conventional category and a total of 20 million internally displaced persons. That makes what we call in UNHCR a total population of concern to UNHCR almost 40,000 people who have been declared of competence to the office to look after their, their protection and assistance needs. Where Syria, if we took the top 10, Syria is number one at the list of the top 10 with refugees outside of Syria, asylum seekers pending, but especially internally displaced persons within Syria today. And that makes a registered number of Syrians as of the mid of 2013 to 6,237,000 uh, 6, people, which by now unfortunately has increased. Just very quickly running through to show you how this organization operated. When UNHCR was set up, we had 30 staff members with a budget of $300,000 to take care of 2.2 million foreign refugees and displaced persons after World War II in Europe. So the then High Commissioner, Goddard from Holland, went out of his way to find money outside and the Ford Foundation helped. The second High Commissioner started already the vision operating outside of Europe. And that coincided in his time with the independence war of Algerians who fled outside. So we are seeing now an out of area operation as we say in the NATO language, where UNHCR gets involved in large repatriation reintegration operations after the independence wars in the 60s. <coughs> then we had for 17 years the High Commissioner Sadruddin Aga Khan. He has done many things and of course what I'm showing here are just a few which would fit the criteria of innovation for this book. He really worked with states, the General Assembly and major states to widen the mandate to have people <coughs> produce as refugees in all continents from Palestine to Vietnam, Angola, Chile, in the southern hemisphere, besides, of course, the eastern hemisphere, which in the Cold War was producing many refugees. And the biggest thing which is in his legacy is the international humanitarian response, 1971, to the Bangladesh crisis, which was an exodus of 10 million refugees Bengalis and it uh, was dealing with the displacement of 30 million people which was very uh, deep sign in humanitarian affairs. The High Commissioner Paul Hartling, I had started with Sagarin Aga Khan but Paul Hartling then started to push the borders in terms of who is the refugee and that started in Latin America with the 84 Cartagena Convention uh, declaration where we got additional grounds on the basis of what people could be recognized as refugees. Generalized violence, foreign aggression, internal conflicts, massive human rights violations and seriously disturbed order and in fact this definition later was taken on by the Africans in the African uh, Union Convention on Refugees. Jean-Pierre Hawker started as the first to consider we have to know what's happening inside the countries and not just always accept de facto when situations have arisen and refugees have been produced. Of course, early warning comes from the military language and uh, states were very sensitive that a humanitarian organization should be interested in wanting to know about uh, situations arising in their countries sovereignty questions again, and that's when I got involved with UNHR's questions on early warning. Stoltenberg was very active in getting UNHR involved in the first integrated UN peace missions, 
and then uh, in the repatriation of many Vietnamese to uh, Vietnam, uh, very intensive monitoring of the well-being of the returnees because there was a lot of uh, res resistance by some states that people should uh, return to Vietnam. Many of you know Sagata Ogata, especially our dean, uh, Martha uh, Mino. Uh, she really stick, stick her neck out to internally displaced persons and made sure to the extent that her office was able that action was taken. She was the first one briefing the UN Security Council as a humanitarian representative, recognizing the, the immediate link between security and the production of refugees, international security. Because the Security Council is to seize matters which are a threat to international peace and security. So with her going to the Security Council, states recognized in inviting her that a presence of large numbers of refugees can be a threat to international peace and security. She was also the one to say, well, we have no other choice. We have to get people back home, even if the situations are still very difficult. That's in Tajikistan and in some other places. And she was the one really, not just in terms of policy and law, but also in training of the UNHCR staff members and colleagues of the NGO community that we have to have all to be trained in human rights law. The High Commissioner Ruth Lovers did one thing, many other things, but he got rid of the temporary limitation. When the Office of the High Commissioner was created in 1950, it was created for five years, and it had to be renewed all the time in the General Assembly. And every year when we had to renew the mandate, it was quite a stress to have to do that. And now the General Assembly in 2003 acknowledged that UNHCR continued to work until the refugee problem is solved. The current High Commissioner has done many things, former Prime Minister of, uh, of uh, Portugal, he set up the innovation section with a donation of 110 million grant of the IKEA Foundation. He's very concerned about what might happen with people forcibly displaced after climate change. It is now an operation with 7,000 staff in 120 countries. 88% of our colleagues in the field and the budget is $5.3 billion. The research frame for this book is 60 years for the High Commissioners and case studies during the functions of my work in UNHCR 77 to 2006. For the Chilean and Vietnamese, as I have started as a volunteer in 73, it goes from 73 to now because I have been visiting twice Chile now and uh, also with the Vietnamese I have worked alongside. For whom is these books? For students, scholars, and practitioners who are interested to go on these missions in these different fields around the world. The teaching note uh, is something to help teach this material, even if one isn't obligatorily 100% uh, expert in the matter, because the uh, materials are presented in such a manner that students are guided through uh, learning from them. The main point of the case studies, the Disembarkation Resettlement Office offer which we negotiated in Singapore contributed to save 60, 67,000 Vietnamese boat people. The negotiation in Chile helped to bring an end to uh, the prohibition of return for initially estimated 200,000 Chileans prohibited to return. In Namibia we had 40,000 to go back and in the ITC it's now a lot of crowdsourcing, biometric refugi refugee registration, and community technological access centers, and many other things for refugees themselves to stay in touch. This is just an unpublished material which I got from my former classmate from the Kennedy School in 86, 87, who is now the Deputy Prime Minister in Singapore, who, with his Ministry of Home Affairs, helped me to get this material done. To sum up, 
the uh, innovation has been an integral part of UNHCR's international protection function with the humanitarian partners, governmental, non-governmental, but we are always standing between people endangered and the state authorities. National sovereignty is still the name of the game. And the challenges for the future is, as we will hear from our colleagues, to uphold protection standards, uh, to get uh, recognition to be protected is uh, a life and death question on an individual, on a group basis, armed conflict, climate change, and as I borrowed, soft power and increasing power diffusion from state to non-state actors will have very serious security risks. The High Commissioner himself is warning that we have to stay together, to work together for the future. And I'm pretty, very happy now to uh, let my uh, colleagues speak on the uh, topics which we have discussed. But before I'd like to finish with the uh, word of David Kennedy saying that this is a fascinating overview of the dilemmas facing those engaged in refugee protection. It's a chronicle of uh, strategies used by pr practitioners in various cases to navigate the unavoidable political and ethical challenges of this work. And now I would like to uh, let uh, Christiane Lemke, professor at NYU, speak after saying that uh, Professor David Kennedy couldn't be with us because his father just passed away and we are thinking of him. And uh, I pass on <coughs> to Professor Christiane Lemke on Hannah Arendt, the right to have rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. I first met Louise about 10 years ago in uh, Germany, in Hanover, where I was teaching international relations. And Louise came to me and she said, um, I worked for the uh, UN High Commissioner for Refugees for many years. I'd like to share my insights with your students. And uh, we were very delighted to have her as a teacher in Hanover. And I'm even more delighted that she actually managed to put together her experience and her insights from more than 30 years of working with refugees into this wonderful book, which will hopefully inspire a lot of teachers to teach um, and to share insights uh, about the work uh, on the ground, the field work, um, and also inspire students to uh, get involved in the refugee aid and support work, which is so crucial. Um, <clears throat> Louisa has asked me to share some thoughts with you how international relations actually approaches the refugee problem. And uh, when we talked uh, in preparation, I thought it would be a wonderful idea to speak about uh, Hannah Arendt, um, a political philosopher. Yeah, we can pass that around. Um, who shares with uh, Louise and myself, she was born in Hanover, in the very town where uh, Louise is teaching um, and where I hold my professorship. She um, was herself a refugee. Uh, she had to flee Germany from Nazi persecution. She fled to Paris and then to the United States where she lived and taught in New York City at the New School. Uh, one of the most um, significant political philosophers of the 20th uh, century. The idea to protect refugees is actually very, very old. It dates back to ancient times. It is found in many religious um, instructions and scripts in the Bible, in the Torah, to be uh, open and take in foreigners to be hospitable, uh, this kind of hospitality towards people who are strangers in strange lands. In the uh, philosophy of the Enlightenment, the idea to protect 
refugees. Again, comes up, Immanuel Kant writes about it, and he thinks of a kind of cosmopolitan set, uh, setting in which refugees would be invited and accepted in host societies to preserve peace. That was his core idea. Hannah Arendt, in the early 20th centuries, witnesses imperial globalization. That is to say, she witnesses the results of the First World War and the breakdown of the big empires, the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Habsburg Empire. And she's concerned about the number of people who are fleeing, uh, who become stateless, who have no citizenship all of a sudden because the state they lived in uh, disintegrates, changes, and they have no place. And the other uh, problem she's concerned about, as you may all know, is totalitarianism. She studied the Bolshevik Revolution and also the rise of totalitarianism in Germany. And again, she was concerned about the refugees coming from Russia and the refugees that were produced by a very brutal, inhumane Nazi dictatorship, uh, including her own fate, even though she never really wrote about her own experience. She was more analytical. And one of the thoughts uh, she came up with was the idea uh, that it is very important in political communities the right to have rights. Uh, the right to have rights, which is much more fundamental than having civil rights or political rights. It is something that comes before uh, and should be universal and should be uh, a given for any person because she very clearly saw that the state could fail, a state could fail to protect, protect its citizens. She was very enthusiastic about the French and the American revolutions and the idea of republicanism and the idea that modern states established for the first time individual civil rights. <clears throat> but she also witnessed a contradiction. What happens if states fail to protect its citizens? And Louise um, just said, the states are the main, or the governments of states, are the main partners in negotiating settlements for refugees. Well, um, what happens if the states are either authoritarian, totalitarian even, or uh, if states are too weak, failing to protect its citizens? When um, she was writing her thoughts on the political theory of the rights to have rights, no United Nations existed. The League of Nations was too weak to protect uh, citizens who became refugees. And some individual efforts, such as Friedrich Nansen's passport, the Nansen passport to, to protect refugees, uh, only helped a small number of uh, people. So with the establishment of the United Nations, we're actually entering a completely different phase where it's not only national law, but international law that can and does protect citizens. And this is a very important innovation in itself. And uh, Louisa has just shown how uh, this innovation in itself kind of evolves, develops, uh, moves beyond the 1951 uh, Refugee Convention to uh, include internally displaced persons. So uh, the moral and the ethical questions raised by Hannah Arendt, what happens to people, individuals, who are no longer protected by their states, um, has been brought to the international uh, public sphere and is now international law. However, having said this, one of the disturbing findings in Louise's book, uh, and she mentions that towards the very end, is that um, the, uh, the um, uh, refugee protection, as good as it may be, is really suffering at this point in time. There are more refugees, more internally displaced persons than the UN can protect. Uh, 
So the status of refugee protection um, is under, um, you know, is facing big uh, challenges here. <clears throat> and I'd like to point out three of these challenges. Very briefly, one is the problem of failing states. I just mentioned that. Uh, number two is the declining numbers of wars, but increasing number of interstate conflicts. And number three is an expectation capability gap. That is, we are expecting a lot from United Nations protection uh, policies, but the capabilities are limited. And that's where people like Louisa come in with the three E's, energy, empathy, and engagement. Thank you. Wow, very nice. Thank you so much, Christian. Uh, Heidi, let's make a chart that we can hear. Yeah. I'll try and stick to my five to six minutes as best as possible. Um, so first, thanks so much to Louisa for asking me to be part of this great panel and to celebrate your book, which is, a, I mean, obviously a physically and a metaphorically massive <laughs> achievement. Um, I first met Louisa last year. Um, when we started talking about um, events at the end of World War II involving uh, sexual violence and displaced German women, um, and it's been a pleasure to get to know her. Um, so she's asked me to speak in light of International Women's Day, which is just around the corner, um, and the relationship between challenges in refugee law um, and wartime sexual violence. Um, so today, the protection of women and children, and women and children in general go together in the policy documents. Um, <clears throat> protection for women and children from rape and other forms of sexual violence is very much a major sub-industry of the global governance regime and also the international human rights regime. Um, the prosecution of sex crimes uh, is a key priority in international um, tribunals for the UNDP and their programs, which include providing legal aid to rape victims. Um, the UN has a special representative on sexual violence. We hear about it all the time. Um, and sexual violence has also become a key priority for the UNHCR, which has a whole set of programs and guidelines about how to deal with it um, in displacement situations. Um, and Louise has eloquently pointed this out many points during uh, her book, especially in terms of the Vietnamese boat people and the very real and grave risks um, that females um, in that situation faced, uh, particularly at the hands of pirates on the open seas. Um, so the UNHCR itself takes the position, uh, and I quote, that women and girls face every day specific risks that are less likely and are less likely than men and boys to have access to their rights. The agency notes that in situations of displacement, the risks of sexual and gender-based violence are especially pronounced. So it's not that more women and girls are displaced than men and boys. The populations are about 50-50, as Louisa points out many times. Um, but that in the precarious circumstances generated by conflict and displacement, women and girls are both at a higher risk of rape and sexual violence than they are in ordinary society situations. Um, and that their risks are elevated vis-a-vis -vis the male refugee population, and this is a key point. So the now famous UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security reiter reiterates this basic position, so the orthodox position. Um, and I quote from it, expressing concern that uh, women and children account for the vast majority of those adversely affected by armed conflict, including as refugees and internally displaced persons, and singles out this, that sexual violence is a particularly odious cause of women's suffering in war. Um, so put simply, the particular needs of women and girls are taken into include um, protection from rape and sexual violence. So rather than enumerating other particular forms of violence or harm that women might face, it's sexual violence and rape that's reiterated over and over and over again. Um, so while sexual violence is a real and hideous transgression, obviously, that probably does disproportionately affect refugee populations, um, I want to point out that new evidence is emerging that challenges the exceptionalism that's accorded to rape as a harm, that women disproportionately suffer vis-a-vis -vis men in displaced populations. So studies suggest that men and boys experience sexual violence in all conflicts, from Africa to the Balkans, to Latin America, to the Middle East. Um, and in some conflicts, the proportion of male victims of sexual violence to female victims is at least equal. Some suggest um, in some conflicts even more. So for example, reports suggest 
that while the nature of the social stigma suffered by these men is definitely different from the nature of the stigma suffered by women, it's no less severe. So the director of the Ref Refugee Law Project in Uganda um, has recently summarized the attitude of international organizations to male rape as follows. Um, and I quote extensively, the organizations, according to him, working on sexual and gender-based violence don't talk about it. Male violence, it's systematically silenced. You're very, very lucky if they'll give you a tangential mention at the end of a report, you might get five seconds of, oh, and men can also be the victims of sexual violence. When a male rape survivor was referred to the UNHCR in Uganda, they told him, we have a program for vulnerable, vulnerable women, but not for men. Um, so while sexual violence is in general underreported in displacement situations and in general, according to experts, it's almost never reported when the victims are male. So my goal in these very brief remarks has been to suggest that as legal scholars, as activists, practic practitioners concerned with alleviating suffering and harm engendered by war and displacement, we ought to be extremely wary of the UN system's totalizing discourse about the centrality of sexual violence to women's lived experience of conflict. The discourse has potentially negative and disempowering effects for women. It assumes that the most harmful element of conflict and displacement for women is sexual in nature, as opposed to poverty, um, property dispossession, other physical harm, hunger, um, death of their children, loss of their husbands, etc. Um, thus reinforcing the negative effects of rape, including social stigma, shame, and loss of social position, and deprives women, often I would argue, of the agency to determine for themselves what constitutes their greatest areas of need in conflict and displacement situations. Um, one gender divide that is relatively clear, however, is that the perpetrators of sexual violence um, in displacement and conflict tend to be male. Um, and so in our efforts to combat sexual violence, and Louisa is very hopeful in general, so I'll offer a little bit of hope. Um, <laughs> in our efforts to combat this problem, I think uh, it would make sense to move away from programs that focus solely on female victims and toward a more perpetrator-based approach. Um, and I know Louisa is closely acquainted with the work of the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative that's doing some really path-breaking studies on um, examining perpetrator motivations and causes, particularly um, in Africa. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heidi. So now um, we would like to hear Palma Lawrence from her experience defending asylum seekers, um, both in Michigan, uh, having worked in UNHCR and now in the Harvard uh, Immigration Refugee Clinic. Thank you. Thank you, Louise, for inviting me to speak today. I'm really honored sure, to be able to you. comment on your book. Um, like Louise said, I'm going to primarily speak from the perspective of an advocate representing asylum seekers as they seek recognition as a refugee under United States law. But I did also have the opportunity as a law student to intern at UNHCR. And I'll just echo that um, I was really happy to see how much innovation really was there. And I was at headquarters even, um, so seeing kind of like from the, the top perspective of everything that was going on. But um, the institution truly is very innovative and introspective. Um, you know, as they're trying to run these massive operations, they also still take time to stop and ask the bigger theoretical questions and be concerned with the individual. Um, the U.S. is also facing these larger problems causing uh, forced migration and changes and challenges that UNHCR is facing, but we have perhaps not been quite as innovative in uh, crafting solutions. It's made for a very difficult climate in which to be representing asylum seekers, but there are still victories. Um, and UNHCR and its resources really do help advocates in obtaining victories for clients. Uh, the handbook and the guidelines that they publish offer advice on how for us to be able to craft claims to best advocate. Uh, and they also are a great source of research on country conditions to actually understand what's going on the ground um, in the countries that our clients may be fleeing. Uh, there are um, a number of issues that are really emerging today, such as gangs, um, and other claims based on gender that are very difficult, but UNHCR has provided guidance to advocates on this. Um, I personally have um, had a success story with a client who um, was seeking uh, escape here in the U.S. from her abusive family situation in Latin America and um, really was able to use guidelines from UNHCR as a guide in advocating for her. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Palma. Every single person is worth a fight, those who have valid claims. 
Thank you. Uh, now we have Liz. And Liz is the person really who has read every single line of this uh, almost 600 page book and asked, what do you mean with that? What do you want the students to learn from this? And so I'm very pleased that Liz could join us and is um, having some thoughts on, from her perspective, what it might do. Liz. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, this is really a tremendous accomplishment for you to get here and be able to talk about this today. Um, Louise's book, um, which I worked with her on the month before she um, sent it to the publishers, um, is a real in-depth look at the strategy and operations of all of these missions. Um, but I think the case studies are what really makes it about the human connection. Um, these are all really human stories, but most students will only encounter these situations in one line in a history book, if that. And it's really rare that you had 40 years of experience to pull from one organization into one book. Um, and I think the case studies really bring that out. She's able to really give tribute to the people that she worked with, um, as well as the actual refugees. Um, and the case studies themselves ask questions that um, really help students reflect on um, the example of soft power and adapting to crisis um, that the UNHCR represents. Um, students are asked to look at decision points um, in the UNHCR um, strategy and think about what they would do in those situations. Um, it really simulates your field work, I think, really well to put these in case studies because um, you have to imagine the unknown. You have to apply to new, um, what you've learned to new situations. Um, and you have to make recommendations um, based on history. And so the teaching note sort of tries to get through all of that. Um, there were two um, sort of class simulations that I really enjoyed. Um, one was um, the crowdsourcing simulation um, that we came up with, which is um, it assigns students into the roles of rebels or community leaders. And this is in the chapter on um, technology and how that impacts um, refugee protection. Um, and the class basically has to determine they don't know who are the rebels in the room or who are the refugees. community leaders yeah, um, and refugees. And um, the community leaders have to decide or have to figure out a way to determine who the rebels are and how they're going to report to their teacher um, who will send out a warning um, about the rebels if, there, if, they, if that information exists. And so it sort of replicated how um, crowdsourcing um, can help refugee protection. Um, there was another um, simulation that we called Loss in Translation. Um, and Louise had been telling me about um, some of the negotiations that she had to do where um, no one, none of the parties spoke the same language. Um, and she was not fluent in the languages. Um, and she still had to negotiate an agreement between these people. And so the students um, would be communicating in different ways, maybe one by pictures, one by gestures. And there would be the, the um, mediators who would have to um, communicate between the groups, but only in short phrases, because that was all that they could really understand. Um, and so I feel like things like that, that really get the students to be in that role of the um, materials. Yeah, that was really, um, I think, made the book come alive and puts, puts people both in the position that, that you were in and also that some of the refugees were in. Yes, thank you so much, Liz. That was so much worth this additional year which you put into the case studies and into the teaching. Thank you so much, all of my colleagues. Um, now I wonder whether Dean Mathamino would like to come here to the microphone because it's being recorded. <laughs> I just stand up and let you have my seat. Well, it's a, it's a fantastic uh, chance, I think, for our community to have a window on to Louisa's a remarkable work uh, and also a window on to 
what it takes to draw lessons from this challenging work. Um, I want to thank you for your presence uh, in our community uh, and for sharing your insights uh, in, informally and in the book. Uh, everyone here has moved once in, or more in your life. You know how dislocating that is. Imagine if it's under the circumstances that produce refugees. Imagine if it's under the circumstances where you have no confidence about your future. Um, the prospects of actually providing uh, real assistance under those circumstances with quickly changing uh, political uh, environment. Uh, what is the role of law? What is the role of any kind of rights? Um, it's a great idea. This book will actually demonstrate what it looks like to actually make uh, rights and law mean something on the ground. So I'm really, really honored uh, the, by your presence here. And I want to commend the library for uh, its uh, support of this work. And next time you're in the library and you see someone working really hard, they could be working on a book as great as this one. <laughs> So we still have a few minutes in case uh, uh, anyone would like to say something. Uh, we need to stick within the hour. And if uh, in the meanwhile, I just could do what I have done in the last uh, 15 years. I served in Kazakhstan, in Bulgaria, and before in Bar uh, Portugal. These were all countries which were celebrating the International Women's Day when my female colleagues would walk into my office with roses and I would walk into their office with roses and that's what I'm going to do now. I will, to the extent that I have enough to my colleagues here, uh, give the roses in the tradition how we did it in the field. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. To you Thank and you. to my two students and I'd like you to meet Ivo Vettia, who did his master's student on IT communities three years ago, and this is Eliana, who's now doing her master's student uh, thesis on the Chinese role on the Palestinian occupied territories, if anyone has an idea. But then we come back to the book. We still have a few minutes, and I'd like to thank you so much for making the time with all the competing events happening in the house and on campus. Thank you so much again. Suzanne for being all the time with her June. and uh, of course to June uh, without uh, you and your thoughtful preparation since October last year and Ash, uh, Ashlan Bulut and all your colleagues I went to see already this morning without all of you this would not have been possible and then of course we give a last good final touch with Lisa and Liz to the whole book so I see, yes, please. Uh, could you, could uh, any of the panelists comment on the challenge that was mentioned about problem states who are creating millions of IEPs and uh, refugees that we've, we've seen us today in Syria and Sudan, Sudan going on quite a long time now, and both countries block aid despite conventions. The uh, aid, aid is blocked and help from UNHCR is Thank you. This is uh, the most crucial question. And what we say in the UNHCR and in the humanitarian communities, refugee protection is a state responsibility. And without states, we couldn't do anything. And so it really takes courage, perhaps the three E's, which Professor Lemke said, engagement uh, and Institutions matter, such as statal institutions, non-governmental institutions, uh, UN and UNHCR uh, offices around the world. But it's in the end, it's the people. At this very moment, the High Commissioner will have spoken in the Security Council of the United Nations in New York on the Syria question, on the Central African Republic emergency and on other emergency. In the end, it is the states, and it is the major states. If they get away with murder, 
Do you think small states will protect people whom they don't like to have around? Forget it. And that is the problem. We have to work through people. We have to get allies in the executive, legislative, or judicial branches in the countries where we are operating as UNHCR representatives and working with our colleagues. And for me, the most difficult operation was Chile, where torture was going on, where I had people after torture in my office without nails, and the secret was police was outside, and I had to call friends in the embassies, send me your car, we need another box of oranges to be transported. Life is at risk in many places, and that's where it is so important to use soft power, and I really would like to acknowledge the suggestion by Professor Lemke to say, use soft power as a means and methodology to understand and explain these problems. It's now one o'clock. I want to be faithful to your time, to the time of Peter, who is so kind to do the video, to our colleagues from the library, and to my co-panelists, and to all of you. And all of you, happy International Women's Day. And may I then recruit you also as goodwill ambassadors for those people in need of protection, if you feel they are in need of protection. And you have to give the benefit of the doubt, and that's what Palma has been experimenting. We cannot exclude before including. That is one of the principles of the Geneva Convention on Refugees. If people tell you, no, they don't deserve uh, protection, you have to first analyze what their claims are. And if you have done that satisfactorily, and if states do that satisfactorily, then they may exclude them and guide people into other regimes, immigration regimes. But we should be careful in using anti-terrorist methods of dealing with people in need of protection. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you.